I want to play for you a piece of Chopin's, the E minor prelude. This is a piece written in 1828. It is one of the most mysterious and alluring pieces ever composed. People looked at it for hundreds of years without agreeing about how it worked. It turns out that there's a translation manual between elementary concepts of music theory, the kinds of things you teach to your 11-year-old beginning music student, and very advanced geometrical ideas, concepts like orbifolds or Mobius strip or singular cone over the projective plane, things that mathematicians have been exploring in the last 50 years. What I want to begin with is the question, what makes music sound good? What is the distinction between random, nonsensical music and music that sounds ordered or pleasant? The geometry and of music is a really particularly interesting topic because it's something that you can interact with in several different ways. You can really come at this subject just from a musical standpoint. You know, I know plenty of jazz musicians who have come across some of these ideas just by spending thousands and thousands of hours at the keyboard. But at the other hand, you can come across these ideas from a more cerebral point of view. You know, you're an algebraic topologist and you want a simple example that you can sort of convey to your students. So I actually think this subject is cool because it's a place where the this sort of lay person and the more advanced mathematician really can meet. One reason why music is hard to comprehend is that there are many functionally equivalent ways of doing the same thing. All of these are ways of playing a C major chord. Here I will press down different collections of keys on the piano, which you can see on the purple piano on the screen. This is a C major chord. This is a C major chord. That's a C major chord. They all look different on the piano. What a geometry does is it arranges a whole bunch of different points so that they stand in some kind of distance relation to each other. And melody often involves moving by short steps. So geometrically, this translates to moving between nearby points in some musical space. And so it's really the melodic focus on nearness that makes a geometrical representation so important because nearness is really the defining feature of geometry. Why does the ear care about distances? That is a great mystery. Nobody knows. The fact is, the ear cares tremendously about distances. In principle, any music could be represented geometrically, but I think it's more informative for some styles than for others. The ideas that I'm talking about are particularly useful when you're talking about Western music, but it doesn't always work for the monodic music of other cultures. And what I find interesting about this is two things. First, Chopin probably could not have given you a very good theoretical explanation of what he was doing in terms of music theory. He would have just sort of sat at the piano and said, this is what I do. But what is interesting, perhaps even more, is that none of Chopin's mathematical contemporaries could have talked about the four-dimensional geometry that he had internalized in a very practical, hands-on way. Because the study of 4D geometry was really in its infancy in 1828, and orbifolds were just a distant gleam in the mathematical community's eye. And that the book I wrote has a lot of musical examples and has some equations in it. And I could imagine writing a book that didn't have equations or examples that really was more of a popularization, something for a sort of a broader audience. And I could also imagine writing a textbook where you take these ideas and really package them as part of an introductory music class, so as a way into music rather than as a sort of more advanced way of thinking about music. There was a period of time in which the most advanced geometrical understanding of these higher dimensional spaces was to be found not in the scholarly works of accredited mathematicians, but in the beautiful romantic piano compositions of the musicians. And I find that just amazing. Having a principled understanding of what music is and how it works, that's really important uh, when you want to compose music intelligently using a computer because you can't be vague when you're talking to a computer. You have to be really specific and tell it exactly what to do. And so I have found that the computer is in many ways a really interesting interface between the abstract world of music theory and the concrete world of, of actual music.